Formula 2, or F2 for short, is the final junior series that drivers most often compete in before they get promoted to Formula 1. F2 is what is known as a spec series, meaning that all the teams and drivers use the same basic car, placing more emphasis on the ability of the driver. The likes of Charles Leclerc, George Russell, Lando Norris, Alex Albon and Oscar Piastri have all come up through Formula 2 to establish themselves as solid Formula 1 drivers, all of whom have stood on the podium at some point, and some of them are even Grand Prix winners. But for every driver who makes it into the big time, there are many others who flounder and fall by the wayside, some for reasons beyond their control, and others for the fact that they just weren't cut out for this level of motorsport. So today, we are going to look at the top 15 worst Formula 2 drivers since the start of the 2017 season, when the series formerly known as GP2 was rebranded into what is now the FIA Formula 2 Championship. So without further ado, let's get straight into it. So, the first driver on this list at number 15 is Ollie Caldwell. Caldwell came into Formula 2 with quite a bit of promise, having finished 8th in the 2021 Formula 3 Championship with a win and three podiums to his name, and he joined the Alpine Academy at season's end. However, these results would not translate when he went up to Formula 2 at the end of the season, as his time in the series would consist of generally uninspired performances at or near the back of the field. For the 2022 Formula 2 season, Coldwell was given a full-time shot with Campos Racing alongside seasoned veteran Ralph Boschung. Unfortunately, Boschung's season was hampered by injury, meaning that he did miss several rounds. However, he did manage to pick up two podiums, as did his replacement Roberto Meri. But sadly for Ollie Coldwell, he came nowhere near this feat. His day of days would come at the Austrian feature race, where he finished outside the points in 11th on track, but benefited from several drivers ahead of him being penalised for track limit breaches, as well as a disqualification for race winner Richard Vashaw, to be classified 6th, subsequently achieving his best F2 result. Sadly though, this was the same race that Roberto Meri picked up a podium. Speaking of track limits, Coldwell himself would be caught out by various infringements, which culminated in him receiving a race ban for the Spa round. After returning, he scored points again at another chaotic feature race at Zandvoort, finishing 8th. But aside from this, Coldwell's performances were pretty underwhelming, particularly in qualifying where his best qualifying was 13th and his average qualifying result was 18.8. .8. Since losing his Campos seat to Cush Miney ahead of the 2023 season, he now competes in the European Le Mans series in the LMP2 class. At number 14 is Sean Galile, also known as Josh Revel's favourite punching bag. Bruh. Mohamed Sean Ricardo Galile became memorable for his KFC backing, since his father Ricardo owns their Indonesian franchise. Despite lacklustre results in European Formula 3 and Formula Renault, Galile managed to secure a seat with Carlin towards the end of the 2015 GP2 season, where he became the first driver to crash at pit exit in Abu Dhabi. His first full season in GP2 with Campos yielded a second place finish in the Austrian feature race, but no further points were scored after this. 2017 in the newly rebranded Formula 2 championship was pretty decent for him, finishing every single race that year with Arden, but even so it was only good enough for 15th in the standings with just 17 points. He finished 15th in the points yet again in 2018, but considering he was now driving for Prema, a front-running team, this was not a good season. Yes, he did achieve a podium in Monaco, which is no mean feat considering how close the walls are, but as with his other podium in 2016, he would score no further points afterward. His teammate Nick de Vries, for context, finished fourth in the championship with three wins and three further podiums, a total annihilation to say the least. Despite this, he stayed with Prema for 2019, now partnering Mick Schumacher, where he was again comprehensively outshined and dropped to 17th in the standings. Michael's son scored a win in Hungary, whereas Galil floundered again and could do no better than a single top 10 finish at the Baku feature race. 2020 would be his final season in F2, 
partnering former Red Bull junior Dan Tictum at Dams. This would be his worst season for more reasons than one, as not only did Tictum score 96 and a half points to Galil's three, but the Indonesian was forced to miss several rounds after injuring his back flying over a curb at Spain. Unsurprisingly, after doing very little upon his recovery, he was dropped from Dams and his F2 career was over. The main issue for Galil here was that for every decent result he achieved would come a slew of poor showings, which was non-indicative of a world-class driver cut out for the world of Formula 1, even if his KFC bucket money landed him some free practice outings with Toro Rosso. He now competes in the Asian Le Mans series, where he now actually follows up good results with further good results. At number 13 is Roy Nisani. Roy Nisani grew up in motorsports royalty, as his father Chanok Nisani was a three-time Formula 1 champ. Oh wait, no, scrap that. He did one free practice session where he embarrassed himself to high heaven. The younger Nisani, however, started racing much younger than his father did, at the age of 6 instead of 38. As a result, Roy was much faster and better suited to top-level motorsport, although rather than ending up as an F1 star of the future, he ended up being more like Andrea de Cesaris or Pastor Maldonado in that his car would turn into a battering ram or a Beyblade instead of a race winner. Nonetheless, while he did bring a reputation as an erratic crasher, he also brought something vitally important in the world of motorsports – money. Courtesy of Israeli-Canadian billionaire Sylvan Adams, his time in Formula 3 in his early career wasn't brilliant, but he later developed into a race-winning driver in the Formula Renault 3.5 series, a series that sent Kevin Magnussen, Carlos Sainz, Daniel Ricciardo and many others straight into Formula 1. After the series went under following 2017, Roy Nassani brought his Israeli new shekels over to the Campos Racing Team for the 2018 Formula 2 season. Here, he scored just one point, and was comprehensively outshone by his teammate Luca Giotto, who scored four podiums and 94 points. He missed the entire 2019 season as he was recovering from a bad training injury, but he would be back with a vengeance for 2020 with Trident and a lucrative place at the Williams F1 Driver Academy. His main highlight was starting from pole position in the Belgian sprint race and leading from the start until he got Dan Tictum just three laps in. He wound up finishing 19th in the points with 5 points to his name. 2021 with the Dams team was much of the same, but he finally achieved a podium in Monaco of all places. But it was back down to earth in the next race when he hit the wall at saint de -Vot. He scored points just twice more all year, but his points tally was finally in double digits, with Car 16 scoring 16 points to finish 16th in the standings. 2022 was again an improvement, and the third round at Imola was looking fantastic for our boy Roy. Finishing fourth in the sprint race, he would then have a lightning start in the feature race to go from sixth on the grid to first off the line. He pitted during an early safety car, and he rejoined only behind those yet to make their mandatory pit stops. The stars seemed to be aligning for Nisani. All the struggles, all the bad moments, all the setbacks. They were finally set to pay off once those ahead of him had peeled into the pits he was on course to finally win a Formula 2 race. Except he didn't as he once again threw himself off the racetrack with 15 laps to go. And that summed up his season, with other incidents of note being a collision with Chembola Bassi in Baku, and taking out Dennis Hauger at Silverstone where he almost got decapitated. And then another coming together with David Beckman resulted in him getting a race ban for Monza. He'd improved his points tally again, but only scored 20 points this time. He expected to do better again in 2023 with PHM, as he had increased his points tally year on year. Could this finally be the year he fought for the F2 Championship? No. It wasn't, as he was a big fat zero as he scored no points, being the only full-time driver not to do so. And with that, Roy Nassani's tumultuous Formula 2 career was over. You know something is up with someone's driving when there is a whole section on their Wikipedia page dedicated towards driving standards. His motto, according to his website, is the sky is not the limit, the mind is. Which is ironic considering how brain dead some of his moves in Formula 2 were. Don't get me wrong though, he could be fast on his day. But as I have alluded to a lot here, his own downfall was his own antics.
At number 12 is Santino Ferrucci. While our previous guest Roy Nassani was renowned for numerous incidents, Ferrucci became infamous here in Europe for just one weekend's worth of bad antics. His Formula 2 graduation came when he accepted an offer to take Sergio Canamassas' seat at Trident for the rest of the 2017 season, starting from Round 7 in Hungary. He instantly performed to the task, scoring two points on debut and another two at the next round in Spa, greatly outperforming his more experienced teammate Nabil Jeffrey. Usurping Jeffrey convinced Trident that Ferrucci was the real deal for 2018, and he was duly signed up alongside new teammate Arjun Maney. A sixth place in Baku and more points in Austria were good, but this was as good as it would get for Ferrucci. To say the least, the 2018 Silverstone round for Ferrucci was dreadful. He forced his teammate Miney off the track repeatedly, then crashed into him on purpose on the cooldown lap after the race had ended. Not only that, he was further caught driving his car around the paddock area with one glove off holding his mobile phone. The FIA unsurprisingly banned him for the next two rounds, but this ended up being a permanent ban as Trident subsequently fired him for his unsportsmanlike conduct, along with the non-payment of sponsorship money. This was pretty odd though, because he had money to make his debut in IndyCar earlier that year, so don't really know what was going on there. Ferrucci would be fined €6,000 for driving whilst holding his phone, and ordered to pay a further €502,000 to Trident for the non-payment of money owed to them as part of his contract after the team took civil action against him. After this debacle, Ferrucci retreated back to the States to compete in IndyCar full-time, where, to be honest, he has done pretty well for himself results-wise, especially at the Indy 500, where he has finished top 10 every time he started. But there is still that cloud hanging over him, as he is still occasionally booed by fans during driver introductions. Of course, Ferrucci will have had some time to grow up and learn from his mistakes, but this weekend in 2018 shows that a dented reputation can cast a shadow over anybody, even years later. At number 11 is Amory Cordiel. Apart from winning the Spanish Formula 4 Championship in 2018, Cordiel's junior career did not consist of much success. He moved up to Formula 3 in 2021 with Campos, despite limited success in Formula Renault Euro Cup, and unsurprisingly scored no points that year. But somehow, this was enough to convince Van Amersfoort Racing that he was the right man for the job when they entered Formula 2 in 2022. However, Cordiel would silence the critics by astoundingly finishing 9th on the road to claim two points in his second ever race in Bahrain, but a time penalty would take these away again and from this point on, his season would unravel, big time. A crash in the sprint race in Jeddah would force him to sit out the feature race with too much damage, and then he embarrassingly crashed on his way to the grid for the sprint race at Imola. He continued to draw the ire of spectators and stewards alike, with his constant track limit breaches, being consistently off the pace, and not respecting yellow and red flags. This all came to a head in Baku, where he picked up his 12th penalty point for causing a collision with Coldwell, triggering an automatic race ban for Silverstone. Upon his return, he clearly showed that he had learned his lessons by qualifying an excellent 7th in Austria. And despite some further hiccups and penalty points for track limits later in the season, he finally achieved his first points with 6th at the Zandvoort feature race, and he followed this up by coming within a few laps of a podium in Abu Dhabi's sprint race to finish 5th. A shaky start to the season ended in a much more stable fashion, as he proved that he didn't need a Flemish motorway to showcase his speed for once. A move to Virtuosi for 2023 looked set to continue this upwards trajectory for Cordiel. However, it would be exactly the same story as 2022, not scoring any points until Zandvoort, and then doing so once more in Monza, in a season full of spins, incidents, and being completely on the opposite end of the leaderboard to his front-running teammate Jack Doohan, who finished third in the points with three wins. Cordiel is set to return to Formula 2 for a third season with high tech in 2024, where hopefully he can start the season with good results and carry them through. At number 10 is Cem Bolak Barsi. The only Turkish driver to race in Formula 2, Bolak Barsi's journey up the motorsports ladder was very unconventional to say the least. He'd started up racing in motocross as a child, winning the national championship as a six-year-old, and he then became involved in esports in his late teens. 
competing for Toro Rosso in the official F1 Esports Championship for two seasons. He stepped up to the real thing in 2019 in the GT4 European Series, and in the following years he progressed into Formula Renault, Asian Formula 3 and the Euro Formula Open Series, winning two races in a partial 2021 season in the latter. At the end of 2021, he tested a 2011 spec GP2 car at Bono, and off the back of this got a promotion to Formula 2 with Chiruz in 2022, alongside Enzo Fittipaldi. But this is where the mediocrity began to set in for the young Turk, as a potential top 12 finish in the Bahrain feature race escaped him when he spun on a safety car restart. And then the real baptism of fire would come in Jeddah, where he crashed heavily in practice and was forced to sit the rest of the weekend out. He then topped this off with yet another crash during a test session in Barcelona, breaking a rib and being forced to miss the Imola round as well. He continued qualifying poorly upon his return, qualifying 21st in the next three rounds consecutively, and while he did often make up positions in the early laps of races, he would often slump towards the back by the end. His situation wasn't helped when he collided with Roy Nissani in Baku, which led to a heated exchange between their camps and a €6,000 fine for Bollock Barsi. He finally qualified off the back two rows in Austria, but mechanical issues put him five laps down in the sprint race, and a collision with Liam Lawson put him out early in the feature race. In France, he looked set to finish 13th again, when another last-minute mistake cost him two positions by the end, and he had another retirement in the feature race for good measure. The weekend in Budapest was okay, finishing in the lower midfield in both races, but Bollock Barsi hit financial troubles after this and lost his Chiru seat for good, and he hasn't raced in Formula 2 since then. Nonetheless, Chem has proved himself to be a competent driver in Super Formula since leaving Formula 2, and along with Jan Mardenborough before him, he has set a good precedent for esports competitors with aspirations to race in real-life motorsport. And if you, as an esports racer, were given the same opportunities Bollock Bassi got, would you not give it a go too? At number 9 is Marino Sato. Sato is yet another driver whose results in Formula 3 were less than stellar, scoring only a handful of points in two seasons. He decided to give Euro Formula Open a go in 2019 and it paid off, winning nine races en route to the championship. This performance turned the head of Campos Racing, who signed him up for the rest of the 2019 Formula 2 season in Arjun Maney's place. Over the course of this campaign, Sato performed reasonably, not brilliantly, but reasonably, as it yielded a best finish of 11th at the Monza Sprint Race, but he was also beaten by number one on this list in the feature race. Not a good thing by any stretch. 2020 saw him join Trident, where he scored just one point all season to the five scored by teammate Roy Nissani. Sato would regularly qualify on the back row of the grid and regularly finish near the back as well, apart from in the Mugello sprint race where strategy played into his hands to secure him an 8th place finish. 2021 was almost a carbon copy, with Sato scoring a point for 8th place at the second race in Bahrain, but again due to him languishing at the back in most races, this was the only point he scored all year, compared to the 34 scored by new teammate Bent Viscal. 2022 saw a change in team for Sato as he shifted to Virtuosi, and another change in teammate in promising Australian driver Jack Doohan. 2022 also saw an improvement for Sato, at least by his standards. Instead of scoring one point, he now scored… dun dun, dun dun. He scored six points, but Jack Doohan had beaten him even more convincingly than his other teammates, scoring three wins, three more podiums, and 128 points to finish sixth in the standings. Ouch. This would be Sato's last season in Formula 2, as he was dropped in favour of Amory Cordial for 2023. Overall, Sato's time in Formula 2 saw him hanging around the very bottom of the leaderboards, and he was only there as long as he was due to the generous amount of backing he brought with him. In my opinion, the longer he remained in Formula 2, the more so that the seats he occupied were wasted, as he did very little to inspire with his performances and he never once outperformed a teammate in the F2 standings across two and a half seasons. He now races in the European Le Mans series. At number 8 is Nabil Jeffrey. The Malaysian driver followed a very similar career trajectory to fellow Southeast Asian driver Sean Galayal, albeit with a bit less meme material. He performed alright in German Formula 3 and in the JK Racing Asia series, where he won seven races between 2011 and 2014. This all tanked in 2015, however, when he stepped up to the F3 European Series, as he only achieved two points all season courtesy of a ninth place finish at Zandvoort. Nonetheless, his backing allowed him to join Arden for the 2016 GP2 season. He managed to do better here, with a best finish of 7th at the Baku round, 
when everyone else around him lost their heads. But again, this was the only time he scored points, and again, he scored just two. When GP2 became Formula 2 in 2017, he kept his place in the series, but now with Trident alongside Sergio Canamassas, and later our old friend Santino Ferrucci. Here, Nabil Jeffrey was the weakest driver of the three, comprehensively qualifying last in the opening two rounds, and he never once qualified better than 18th, averaging 19.1 across the season. He stuck to the same routine of the previous two seasons by again scoring just two points with a single points finish, a ninth place at the Jerez feature race. He was distantly last in the standings out of the drivers who did the full season, and finished behind several part-time drivers as well as Canamassas and Ferrucci, who scored three points and four points for Trident respectively, despite barely doing half the season for the team. In recent times, Jeffrey seems to have taken a break from racing, as from what I've found, he hasn't raced since the Asian Le Mans series in 2019, but as shown on his LinkedIn and Instagram profiles, he now works as a regional director for a trading platform called Vestrado. Not sponsored, unfortunately. He appears to be doing pretty well for himself, so while his racing career seemingly crashed and burned, he at least has something to fall back on. At number 7 is Brad Benavidez. Brad Domenico Benavidez Agredo started go-karting in 2017 at the age of 16, the same age Max Verstappen was when he was on the verge of joining Toro Rosso. By the time he joined PHM Racing for their first season in Formula 2 in 2023, Benavidez had never achieved a win, podium, pole position, or a fastest lap across all his car racing career. In fact, in this period, he had only scored 43 points across four different seasons, and only one points finish at Formula 3 level. So already a huge challenge for the young Guatemalan, Spanish, American, whatever he is. But surprisingly, he outqualified his teammate Roy Nassani to go 20th in Bahrain, but finished behind him in 19th place in race 1, and almost 30 seconds behind the next car in the second race. In Jeddah he qualified just 1.3 seconds off, the next car in front of him. A lowly 18th place finish in race 1 wasn't great, but he still did beat our old friend Amory Cordiel. Cordiel showed everyone what he thought of this on lap 2 of race 2 by squeezing Benavidez into the turn 1 wall. Melbourne continued the decline in his qualifying form by going nearly 2 seconds slower than everyone else. And things would only get worse when he crashed during a safety car period attempting to catch back up to the field. He did perform better in race 2 however where he got a 12th place finish. But then he embarrassed himself even further in Baku when he attempted a spin turn after skating down an escape road only to nose himself into a barrier. There was a silver lining from this weekend, however, in that he did achieve his best finish of 10th, although this did require the help of others on the final restart. Monaco was again reasonable, at least by his standards anyway, as he qualified just half a second off the next car, and he grabbed a P11 in the sprint race, and then he went back to a more average 16th in the second race. And he kept it out of the barriers this time. Spain was a weekend to forget, another last place qualifying and penalising his way to a distant last place finish in race 2. He qualified better in Austria with 18th, and he stayed in touch with the pack, but again he never troubled the point scorers. An awkward collision with Clement Novelak in Silverstone brought him right back to earth, and then after two more 18th place finishes in Hungary, financial difficulties pulled the plug on his Formula 2 career. In short, his mediocre junior career was a prelude to his lacklustre Formula 2 campaign, and looking back at it, it was no surprise that he couldn't really cut it at this level. Benavidez has not raced since, but on a convenient segue, his demise did open the door for the next driver on this list. And so, the man who replaced Benavidez is next at number 6. Josh Mason was unexpectedly called up to race for PHM at the spa Francorchamps round in 2023. He had performed reasonably in the Euro Formula Open series, finishing top 5 in all the races he partook in in 2023, but unfortunately it soon became clear that he was way out of his depth in Formula 2. He struggled with reliability all weekend and didn't help matters when he crashed during qualifying, not setting a time. He was almost lapped in the sprint race and finished 45 seconds off the next car, and then had an embarrassing moment with his own teammate Nissani during a safety car period in the feature race. Despite this tumultuous weekend, he was kept on for the remaining three rounds of the season, thanks to backing from Gamebridge. And from here on in, he cleaned up his act and started having fewer incidents, often managing to finish races ahead of other cars. His season ended with a mechanical retirement in the Abu Dhabi feature race, 
but he was still invited back to PHM for their post-season testing programme. Mason looked set to return to the team for a full season in 2024, but last-minute funding issues prevented that from happening, with the seat going to Taylor Barnard instead. As nice of a guy he is, he is unfortunately another case of a driver hastily jumping up to Formula 2 before he was really ready. And while a return to Formula 2 in the future isn't impossible, the chances of that happening aren't great as things stand. At number 5 is Gianluca Petikoff. Petikoff had a promising junior career, finishing second in the 2019 Italian Formula 4 Championship and following this up with a championship win in the Formula Regional Series in 2020. But this was as good as it would get, however, as instead of doing the logical thing and stepping up to Formula 3, he would bypass it entirely and go straight into Formula 2 in 2021, driving for Campos alongside Ralph Boschung. Now, this is a huge gamble. It's essentially like going all in in a game of poker, knowing you could lose your entire hand. And that's exactly what happened. After qualifying on the back row for Bahrain, he barely finished ahead of Alessio de Leda of all people in the first sprint race. The second sprint race was slightly better, with Petikoff finishing 13th, beating four other cars and staying out of trouble when others didn't. Unfortunately in the feature race he couldn't avoid trouble, as his own fire extinguisher went off, forcing his retirement. But the next round at Monaco is where things really fell off a cliff for the young Paulista. His engine dramatically expired during practice, and then during the first sprint race he crashed all by himself at the swimming pool section on lap 25. Things only got worse for him as he crashed again at the first corner of the first lap of the second sprint race, and finally had a collision with Jihan Daruvala in the feature race. He did actually finish the race this time, albeit down in 16th. After this particularly horrible weekend, he left Campos and Formula 2 due to budgetary constraints, and he was replaced by Matteo Nanini. He didn't race for a while after this, but he eventually ended up right back at square one, as he went right the way back down to the European Formula Regional Series later in 2021, and only managed two top 10 finishes here. His open wheel career fizzled out after this, and he has since returned to Brazil where he currently competes in the domestic stock car series. A Formula 2 gamble that obviously backfired, and has cost Petikoff a proper chance to show his potential in the top level of motorsport. At number 4 is Tatiana Calderon. The only woman to race in FIA Formula 2 since its rebrand, the Colombian already had a vast array of connections by the time she was even born, with her father being a cousin of former Colombian president Juan Manuel Santos. With her parents running a Kia dealership in Bogota, young Tatiana was exposed to cars very early on, and so decided at the age of 9 to focus on a motorsports career. She performed reasonably in the American Star Mazda series in the early 2010s before going to Europe and the European Formula 3 Championship, where she spent three seasons scoring just 29 points, all of which came in the 2014 season, where she had a single top five finish to boast about. This, however, means that two of these campaigns were completely void of any points. She then spent the next three seasons in GP3, where this time she only scored a combined 20 points, but did score points in all three of those seasons, including eight top 10 finishers in the last nine races of 2018. This no doubt caught the attention of BWT Arden, who signed her up for the 2019 Formula 2 season alongside reigning GP3 champion Antoine Hubert. Now, to partner a GP3 champion with someone who finished 16th in that same championship is easier to predict than playing the lottery with a crystal ball. Long story short, she was never going to amount to anything her teammates did. For the first round in Bahrain, she qualified 1.3 seconds off of Hubert and 2.3 seconds away from pole sitter Luca Giotto. And while Hubert was comfortably fighting in the top half of the field, Calderon was squandering in the lower midfield. Baku was even worse as an 18th place in qualifying led to a double DNF in the races, including a first lap collision in the sprint race. Although she did briefly lead the feature race before she dropped behind those on fresher tyres, before mechanical issues put pay to any result. Two 13th place finishes in Spain were decent by her standards, but Hubert grabbed a 5th and a 6th that weekend, so not great from that perspective. The gap was only magnified further in Monaco, as she was over 2 seconds off the pace in qualifying, finishing 15th and last in the feature race, and was first to retire in the sprint race with a crash at Mirabeau, while Hubert won the race. The qualifying gap increased further at Paul Ricard, as Calderon was almost 4 seconds off pole, 
and 2.4 seconds off her teammate, who would go on to finish 8th in the feature race and take a second win in the sprint race in front of his home crowd, whereas in the feature race she would finish 30 seconds off the next car in 11th and would spin off in the sprint race. Austria was similar again, with Calderon qualifying last whilst Hubert qualified 2nd, and Hubert would finish 4th with Tatiana 17th, but she would actually beat her teammate for the first time in the sprint race, although it did take him picking up a puncture and a time penalty for this to happen. Arden scored no points in the next two rounds, but she continued to be miles behind her teammate. Sadly though, Calderon would be the sole representative at the Monza round after Hubert's death in Belgium. Monza, however, was a disaster as she was 12 seconds off the pace in qualifying. She then spun off early in the feature race and finished well outside the points in the sprint race. She was then joined by Artem Markolov for the Sochi and Abu Dhabi rounds to end the season, where he instantly outshone her by qualifying a second ahead of her both times. Reliability problems really prevented Markolov from doing a great deal, but Calderon came nowhere near any points on any of these occasions and finished the 2019 season as the only full-time driver not to score any points. Unsurprisingly, she was not retained for 2020, and moved on to race unsuccessfully in Super Formula and the IndyCar series. Nonetheless, she secured backing from Colombian singer Carol G to return to Formula 2 at the end of 2022, replacing the previously mentioned Chem Bollock Bassi at the Charus team. However, this was arguably even worse than her first stint in the series with BWT Arden, she managed no better than 18th in any of the races she finished, and continued her previous trend of being far off the pace in qualifying, and then failed to finish any of the races at Zandvoort, where she spun off in race 1, and was caught up in a pile-up in race 2. She failed to finish any of the Monza races either, colliding with Ollie Caldwell at the start of race 1, and not even starting race 2. Yas Marina brought yet another last place in qualifying, and two races of finishing well behind the rest of the pack, and unsurprisingly again, she was not retained into the following season. Now, Calderon has served as a great ambassador for women in motorsport, even if she couldn't quite cut it with the other guys in Formula 2. And I can tell you this now, she certainly won't be the last woman to race at this level. And with a ton of female talent to look out for in F1 Academy these days, who knows what the future holds? That's likely another video in itself one day. At number 3 is Gilherme Samaya. Another Paulista, Samaya came through the domestic Brazilian Formula racing scene, culminating in him winning the Formula 3 Brazilian Championship in 2017. He moved over to Euro Formula Open for 2018, picking up one podium to finish sixth in the standings, and then returned to the series for the first four rounds of 2019, where he grabbed another podium along the way. At the end of that season, he was able to secure a test with Formula 2 team Campos, and impressed the team with his adaptation to the car to the point that they signed him up for the 2020 season, alongside established teammate Jack Aitken. He showcased that he was ambitious early on, because when he was asked in an interview what his biggest fear was, he answered not making it into Formula 1. Sadly for him though, this fear would be realised. The season started later than planned due to the global pandemic, and since this meant Samaya hadn't raced competitively in over a year, it would be an uphill struggle for him to say the least. And a struggle it was, as it was very much a nothing season for him, so I'll try to be as brief as possible. His average grid position was 21.3, he qualified slowest in 8 of the 12 rounds that year, and twice had a best qualifying performance of 19th, whilst Aitken grabbed two podiums and was a solid and regular midfielder, scoring points frequently, whilst Samaya unsurprisingly scored zero points, and had a best finish of just 14th at Monza. Despite his lacklustre pace, he finished all but two races that year, only one of them was due to an incident. So at least, if the championship was down to keeping one's nose clean, he'd be very much in the hunt. Aitken was promoted to Formula 1 for the 2020 Sakia Grand Prix to replace Mercedes-bound George Russell, meaning he missed the final race of the Formula 2 season that weekend. Ralph Boschung, who had replaced Aitken at Campos for the weekend, had been sidelined for the whole year up to this point due to previous budgetary problems. And despite his rustiness, he dispatched of Samaya no problem by outqualifying him and beating him to 14th in the only race they finished, whilst Samaya finished 22nd and last in this race and was the only car in the field to finish a lap down. Following his baptism of fire and smoke in 2020, his generous backing landed Samaya a testing opportunity with Charus, and he would subsequently join the team for 2021 alongside F3 graduate David Beckman and he was immediately much more on the pace compared to where he was in 2020, as he qualified a personal best 17th and finished 11th in race 1 in Bahrain, 
which would have been ninth had it not been for a 5 second penalty. He matched this result in race 2 but dropped to 16th in the feature race. But hey ho, at least he was regularly starting to beat people and show the flashes of speed that took him to the Brazilian F3 title all those years ago. But Monaco was a dip in form for Samaya as he qualified second slowest in his group and recorded finishes of 17th, 13th and 15th respectively in the three races, finishing a lap down in the latter two of them. Come Azerbaijan though, it seemed like he was slipping further back towards his 2020 form, as he qualified 20th and finished 17th, 14th and 18th in the three races, being lapped for the second feature race in a row. Silverstone was even worse as he spun off in race 1, finished 17th in race 2 and in no man's land in 20th in the feature. If you thought things couldn't get any worse for him, well, you'd be very wrong. The next round in Monza saw him qualify a distant 21st, half a second behind his new teammate Enzo Fittipaldi in 13th, who was making his very first F2 start. Mechanical problems would put both Sharu's cars out in race 1, and it would affect Samaya again in race 2, but then he would crash out on the first lap of the feature race, becoming the first driver to get a triple DNF in a Formula 2 weekend. Ouch. Russia would see an upturn in form for Samaya as he was finally able to outqualify a teammate, even if he did only qualify 19th again. Two 13th place finishes were what he brought home, finishing comprehensively ahead of Fittipaldi in the former and only just behind him in the latter race. But Jeddah saw him return to form, and by that I mean his Monza form, because he crashed in all three races that weekend. Firstly, he was hit by Oli Caldwell in race one, sending him into Marino Sato. And then he squeezed Alessio de Leda into the pit wall at the start of race two. And finally, he was collected by a spinning Caldwell at the end of the shortened feature race. This weekend alone would have been enough to put anyone on this list. Although Oli Caldwell was no doubt a thorn in his side here. But still, having two race weekends where you fail to finish any of the three races is not a good statistic. A 21st place in qualifying for Abu Dhabi preceded two 16th place finishes and a better by his standards 12th place finish. And after failing to find a place on the 2022 grid, Samaya hung up his helmet in disgust and retired from racing altogether. To be fair to Samaya though, he was compromised in his rookie season through the delayed start to the season. But he made up for this by keeping out of trouble more often than not. But his sophomore campaign saw somewhat of a trade-off as he increased his relative pace but also increased his propensity for crashing and spinning. He has left the door open to a possible return to racing, but there's no doubt that we've seen the last of him in Formula 2 now. And of course he has to live with his biggest fear, as needless to say he didn't make it into Formula 1 after all. So it all comes down to this, the top two in this list, of which you could realistically put in either order. But for number two, I've gone with this guy, Alessio De Leda. Likely a result of his career beginning very late, thanks to his parents preventing him from racing as a child, De Leda essentially decided to speedrun his racing career, having not started racing competitively until 2017, when he started out on motorbikes, and switched to cars in 2018 having not found much success on two wheels. Sadly though, not finding success would become a running theme for De Leda, as his first campaign on four wheels, the 2018 Italian Formula 4 Championship, yielded a 38th place finish in the standings with zero points, finishing in the top 20 just five times out of 21 races. Now, any rational driver would stick it out in the same series to hone their skills after results like this. But this is Alessio de Leda we're talking about here. So, he decided to increase the difficulty settings even further for himself by stepping into FIA Formula 3 for 2019, driving with Campos. Yet another driver for Campos, I'm sensing a theme here. In this campaign, he drowned compared to younger, faster and more experienced teammates Alex Peroni and Sebastian Fernandez, and had a best finish of 16th all year, meaning he once again scored no points, and was last in the standings of the drivers who did the full season. A campaign in Formula Renault Euro Cup that same year yielded nothing either. But he did do something unimaginable compared to what he did in other series. He won a race. Yes, that's right, Alessio de Leda won a race in the Formula 3 Central European Zone Championship. But unfortunately, this is about as good as saying you found a penny on the floor, but you're standing next to the Trevi Fountain in Rome and your hands are wet. Speaking of things that are worthless, De Leda kept his Campos drive in Formula 3 for 2020 and somehow digressed in performance. He had a single 20th place finish to his name as his best result, and despite doing the full season, finished 34th in the standings in a 30-car championship 
behind several reserve drivers and part-time drivers. But he was able to show off his speed in other ways though, as his name was linked to a series of videos showing reckless driving and speeding on Italian motorways. Former Formula 1 driver Guido van der Gaard put it perfectly, saying that it was the first time De Leda was actually overtaking other cars. This didn't do his reputation much good, but astonishingly Formula 2 team HWA Race Lab saw something in him and signed him up for the upcoming 2021 F2 season. One thing that was less surprising than De Leda's signing was De Leda's performance, or lack thereof. He was 1.6 seconds off the next car in qualifying at Bahrain and finished 18th and last in race 1, before races 2 and 3 saw him retire with driveshaft issues and first lap accident damage respectively. But Monaco was diabolical however, and he drew the ire of many fans and pundits alike when he set his fastest lap in qualifying outside the 107% time and so failed to qualify for the race as per the regulations. But he was still curiously allowed to race, as HWA proved to the FIA that technical difficulties were to blame rather than him. But most of us still thought that the technical difficulty was De Leda's presence in the car. And then in all three races he would finish a lap down. But the silver lining was that he did get a 12th place finish in race 2, which would prove to be his best result of the season, with 12th being better than anything he'd ever done in Formula 3 before this. In Baku qualifying he continued to be very slow, being 4 seconds off the pace. He was then caught up in a first lap pileup in sprint race 1, before finishing 15th in the second sprint and 19th and a lap down in the feature race, nearly taking out race leader Yuri Vips in the process. Silverstone was yet another farcical affair as De Leda qualified almost 2 seconds off the next car. He then spun off in race 1, crashed into Ralph Boschung at the start of race 2, and then finished 22nd and last in the feature race, being the only driver in the field not to finish on the lead lap. Rather unsurprisingly, of course. Monza was more of the same, qualifying last by only 7 tenths of a second this time, although this could have been due to the fact that he had more experience at Monza compared to other circuits, being Italian and all. Race 1 went slightly better with a 13th place where he kept himself largely out of harm's way, and a 19th place would follow in race 2, and in either race he wasn't last. And then in the feature race things would change. A bold strategy choice by his team left him running as high as 4th on a safety car restart, which was higher than he'd ever run in his career before that. Could De Leda finally deliver and even grab some points along the way? No, who am I kidding? He drowned on the restart, and slight contact with Enzo Fittipaldi brought his race to an early end. So safe to say he wouldn't score any points. Sochi again saw a near one second gap in qualifying to the next car, and he finished 18th and last in the only sprint race of the weekend, with the other one being rained off, and he was 16 seconds off the nearest car in 17th in the feature race. He technically didn't qualify again in Jeddah as he crashed at the start of his first qualifying run, but he still started anyway, as HWA probably pulled the technical gremlins card out again. Speaking of technical gremlins, these would cause his retirement in race 1, but race 2 was ended by the technical gremlins plaguing Gil Hermes Samaya's ability to make first lap judgments. But by the time the feature race was finally called off due to a series of major incidents, De Leda found himself in 9th place at the end having not pitted. But as the race reverted back a couple of laps, he was demoted back to last again anyway, again leaving empty handed. Abu Dhabi saw him qualify 2 seconds off the next car which is nothing unusual mind you, and his season finished with an 18th in race 1, getting spun out by our old friend Ollie Coldwell early on in race 2, and finishing a distant 19th and last in the feature race, 36 seconds behind the 18th place car. He finished 25th in the season championship with 0 points, and he continued his trend of finishing lower in a series championship than there were total cars competing. An utter disaster of a campaign that showed HWA what everyone else already knew. He was nowhere near worthy of a seat in Formula 2. He last raced in DTM, where he did finally score a point at the end of 2022, but at the best of times he continually brings up the rear of the field. Safe to say, some things never change. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. My pick for the number one worst Formula 2 driver. If you're at all familiar with Formula 2 folklore, this choice is hardly a surprise. It is of course, the one and only, the GOAT himself, Mahavir Raghunathan. There's already a famous video about this guy on YouTube courtesy of a guy named Josh Revel, but nonetheless I shall cover the Indian driver as well, 
because I kind of got to justify why I've put him here. Now, I've used the word mediocre a lot in this video, but I simply can't think of a better word to summarise Raghunathan's junior career. Prior to 2016, he had no wins, no poles, no fastest laps, and just 50 points to his name, most of which came from Italian Formula 4. He endured an abysmal time in the 2015 European Formula 3 Championship, finishing in the top 20 only once, and even failing to qualify at the Po round. I'll say that again, failing to qualify for a race. At Formula 3 level. He had a rather short time in GP3 the following year, and unsurprisingly this didn't yield anything either, and so he decided to move to a championship where he might actually stand a better chance of results. Boss GP. A quick caveat for those that don't know, Boss GP is a championship where older F1 and junior Formula cars are pipped against each other, but mostly due to the fact that most of the drivers in the series are gentlemen drivers and businessmen doing this for a hobby, the authenticity of the series compared to other junior formulas is called into question. Nonetheless, Ragunathan would win the 2017 championship, but only by a small margin. He raced very sporadically in 2018, but caused a bit of a ruckus when his 2019 plans were finalised. That he would be joining Formula 2 with MP Motorsport. What? Information on how he found the funds to pull this off remains pretty scarce, but one thing we can establish was how awful this season would be. In Bahrain, he was half a second off Tatiana Calderon in qualifying, finishing a distant 18th and 19th in the two races, including being lapped in the latter and crossing the start-finish line twice in the same event, earning himself a lot of embarrassment and disapproval from the stewards. For context, this meant that Ragunathan did another lap at racing speed, whilst everybody else was on their cool-down laps after the race had finished and were on their way back to the pit lane. This is also a time when marshals are on the track waving flags and congratulating the drivers. This was pretty boneheaded and very, very dangerous. He is best remembered, however, for his antics at the next round in Baku during a practice session, where he got stuck down an escape road and ended up performing a literal million-point turn, overheating his engine in the process. In qualifying, he was two and a half seconds off the next car and only just missed out on points in the first race when others around him imploded, but finished a long way behind anyone else in the sprint. The rounds at Spain and Monaco brought even more embarrassment for the Indian, as in the former, he was almost lapped again in the feature race, and he was often slower over a single lap than some of the Formula 3 drivers that same weekend. And then in Monaco, he punted out Jack Aitken after ignoring blue flags for him for several laps. And he then got penalised again in the sprint race for one of the most blatant corner-cutting manoeuvres I've ever seen. Not that it ended up mattering much or benefiting him at all though, as Luca Giotto then avenged his friend Aitken on lap 6, showing what everyone else thought of him by taking him out. Ragunathan showed off even more incompetent standards of driving in France, when as a result of multiple virtual safety car infringements, earning him 9 penalty points on his racing licence and triggered an automatic race ban for Austria. When he returned, he was just as far off the pace, being multiple seconds off the next car in qualifying for both Silverstone and Hungary, only finishing ahead of drivers who hit trouble in all four races. More penalties would come for him in Spa when he didn't slow in qualifying for yellow flags. But of course, the races in Spa were never completed due to the tragic death of Antoine Hubert. The field in Monza the next weekend was reduced due to the tragic events of the Belgian race, and in another race where lots of drivers again tripped over each other, Mahavir stayed out of trouble for once and profited to nab a 10th place finish in the feature race and score a point, something he had come nowhere near achieving in Formula 3 or GP3. Could this be the turning point, you ask? Could Mahavir finally turn his season around? Who am I kidding, of course it wasn't. For the next race in Russia, he went back to being nearly 1.7 seconds off the pace in qualifying and then showed his professional driving standards off even more through track limit breaches, again finishing last in both races. This was all starting to add to his fresh tally of penalty points on his license. But then Abu Dhabi was back to square minus one for Ragunathan, as his antics would finally catch up with him as he would get his 24th penalty point on his racing license for the year, which would trigger another automatic race ban for him. How did he do this, you ask? Improper start practice procedures. Basically, when you perform a practice start after a practice session, you've got to do it with no other cars ahead of you. And this is exactly what Ragunathan did, a very dangerous manoeuvre considering what can happen in start line collisions. 
Despite picking up his 24th penalty point on his license, he was still allowed to race and complete that weekend, where he was a second off in qualifying again, and despite having the fastest lap at one point, he still retired in an awkward incident where he struggled to get out of his car properly. In race 2, he finished 15th and a long way off again, finishing off what was clearly the most farcical campaign in Formula 2 history. Understandably, no other Formula 2 team would touch him with a barge pole after this sham of a season. And while he may have been faster on average than what Deleda was, his constant disregard for some of the most elementary of driving standards rules made a total mockery of what is supposed to be the final rung of the racing ladder below Formula 1. And that is why I can confidently declare Mahavira Gunathan as the worst Formula 2 driver in history. It has always cost a lot of money to run a racing team in any series, let alone a top-level series. And by the same token, prospective racing drivers looking to partake in even a full season of karting, let alone anywhere near a series like Formula 1, have to make major financial sacrifices over many years just to compete. And so naturally, and rather unfortunately, a lot of drivers with more money than talent so to speak, are able to get the promotions up the motorsport ladder that perhaps wouldn't be granted to other more deserving drivers. At the start of this video I said that Formula 2 is a spec series, meaning all cars are the same. But despite this, performances do fluctuate from team to team, due to different teams of engineers having different interpretations of how to best set cars up. And also there are a lot of smaller teams in Formula 2 who don't have the same budgets as other teams. This mainly affects Formula 2 teams such as Campos and Trident, as well as the teams now known as Van Amersfoort and PHM. But even among bigger teams, performances can fluctuate season to season. Luckily, you do have the factor of respective driver development programs offered by Formula 1 teams, which helps to give the same opportunities to more naturally gifted drivers, so that they can advance to higher categories and show what they're really made of. But this still doesn't prevent the occasional less deserving driver from slipping through the cracks. Another factor is experience levels, as several drivers on this list could have done with more time in Formula 3 to properly iron out their skills, so that when they would have gone into Formula 2, there would have been fewer question marks regarding their driving ability. And as a result of this higher level of experience, they'd become better able to control the car, keep up with the rest of the pack, and avoid dangerous situations that arose around them. There is also the question of drivers taking unorthodox routes into Formula 2, such as via Euro Formula Open, or in Mahavira Gunathan's case, Boss GP. I should probably look into these series in a future video, but the bottom line is that they don't seem to have the same quantity of quality drivers competing in them, and with the sizes of the fields not usually being anywhere near as big as Formula 3, it means there are fewer solid benchmarks to go off to evaluate how talented a driver from these series really is. But arcing back to the previous discussion, pressure from sponsors, combined with the willingness of some of these drivers to take risks to get into higher categories, creates more scope for less experienced drivers to get into Formula 2 before their time, or perhaps when they just aren't good enough altogether. This point is relevant again as we head closer to the 2024 Formula 2 season, where there could be a couple of future entrants onto this list should I do this video again. Pay particular attention to Rafael Villagomez of Mexico, who only scored four points across three full seasons in F3, and Paraguayan driver Josh Dirksen, of whom is going straight from an average Formula Regional campaign to Formula 2, but this clearly shows that they have the resources to take that leap of faith when the chance arose, courtesy of teams willing to take that chance on them in exchange for some financial backing. And who can blame them, because I'm sure any driver in their position would do it, because I know I certainly would. That's all for this video, thank you very much for watching. Would you have rearranged any of the drivers on this list? Or would you include a driver that was not even included in my list? Do let me know in the comments down below, and while not mandatory, a like and a subscribe is always appreciated. Cheers everyone, and I hope you all have a blessed day.